Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Catholic Defender Radio Show. Tonight with your host Don Hartley, the Catholic Defender, we will examine in depth the truths of our faith and why we believe them. Tonight, Don Hartley's guest host is Dr. Gregory Thompson, an expert on many of the Eucharistic miracles proving the real presence of Jesus in the consecrated host. Tonight, Dr. Thompson will lead an in-depth examination of one of these Eucharistic miracles. Here now is Dr. Thompson. Well, good evening, everyone all the way around the world, and uh, just want to give you a heads up. We're going to get right into things because, uh, you know, we've had some technical glitches. Satan has not wanted this program to be on for the last, uh, I'd say, at least three or four months minimum. You know, he's been uh, attacking us in different ways, uh, you know, moving different nights because of different uh, situations, and finally... Finally, get settled on a, on a night that we can do it consistently on Monday nights, and uh, you know, and then we have a technical glitch the very first uh, time we get uh, have that consistency going forward. So hopefully, those that are listening in will be with us every Monday night uh, from now on, and uh, those that uh, may have left because of the uh, delay in the start, God bless you. We'll. Uh, put it in the archives for you. But uh, tonight, uh, got welcome, uh, Donald, welcome, Judy, and we're going to start on into it because we're on very short time. Uh, start out with a, uh, a quote by Mother Teresa of Calcutta, which really nails uh, some aspects of what we need to really get a handle on, and that's the uh, adoration, to be alone with Jesus, uh, her words are, to be alone with Jesus in adoration and intimate union with him is the greatest gift of love, the tender love of our Father in heaven. How awesome is that, that we have that. And, and uh, you know, I, I saw in the reflections from this uh, uh, weekend that uh, uh, people want to know how they could do adoration uh, if it was a free time for them but it's just ongoing. They just had to make choices, but uh, they wanted to not miss any of the presenters, but they didn't want to miss adoration, and I understand that. You know, if I had to pick between either one, I'd say go to adoration, go. But uh, anyway, they want to be able to do both, which is just not possible. If we have uh, adoration that is uh, back-to-back throughout a conference, somebody's going to miss something, and it's just the nature of the beast. But uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about a uh, Eucharistic miracle in uh, uh, Cassia, uh, Italy, from 1330, you know. And uh, so hold on. This is another one that uh, would be nice to uh, get to see it someday uh, as uh, they have uh, uh, some of the relics of this uh, still in existence. And... uh, that's always an absolutely beautiful thing, you know. And uh, besides adoration, it was nice that we had uh, this last weekend, Donald, the relic room, and we had some relics and had uh, all, all of the rosaries were individually touched to the uh, crown of thorns of our Lord. And so had some special things for the people as far as handouts and then uh, the opportunity to at one of our tables to hold a relic of a uh, second class relic because there's no first class relics of Mary because she was assumed body and soul into heaven. So, uh, but a second class relic of uh, part of Mary's clothing, you know, so that's always a awesome, awesome thing. You want to see little nuns and different uh, adults kiss it, you know, that uh, it was so special to them to get to hold it and, and uh, and like I say, some of them even kiss the the relic, you know, it touched their hearts that much. So anyway, in uh, 1330 at Cassia, a gravely ill peasant called the priest so he could receive communion. The priest, partly through carelessness and partly through apathy, instead of taking the ciborium with him in order to carry the Eucharist to the house of the sick man, he irreverently placed a host in a prayer book. 
When he reached the peasant, the priest opened the book and with astonishment saw that the host was transformed into a clot of blood and the pages of the book were marked with blood. At Cassia, in the basilica dedicated to St. Rita, it's also preserved the relic of the Eucharistic miracle, which happened near Siena in 1330. And a pre, the priest, uh, like I said, you know, he he was uh, when he arrived at the house of the sick man after hearing his confession. You know, well, that's what they should always do first, if they can, is do the confession, and then he uh, and then give them communion. And he opened the book to take out the host which he had placed there. And to his great surprise, uh, he found that the host was stained with living blood, so much as to mark both pages between which the blessed sacrament had been placed. Uh, how many times have we seen this, Donald, where the priest, when something like that happens, whether it's a doubt or doing something, in a way they should have done it. The priest was confused and penitent. I imagine it would make you go to your knees, wouldn't it? He went immediately yeah. to, to Siena, to the Augustinian Priory, to ask the council of Father Simone Fadati uh, of Cassia, known by all to be a holy man. Father Fadati, having heard the story, granted pardon to the priest and asked to be to keep the two pages marked by blood. Many popes have promoted veneration, conceding indulgences. Can you tell them real quick, Donald, what an indulgence is? Well, an indulgence is simply where the Lord gives us or grants us uh, mercy for uh, our past actions. Uh, there's basically two different kinds, but the, in this case, you you have a partial, which is uh, limited, and then you have also indulgences that can wipe away all your purgatory. <laughs> those are great events when you can do that, and the church does those uh, every so often when they have uh, years uh, where they can can. Uh, well, basically having events that uh, you could go to a certain church within a certain diocese when the Pope uh, puts together a uh, for a purpose or a cause, they can do that. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can get a plenary indulgence. That's what that would be, a plenary indulgence. And uh, if you get a chance to do, you know, you can get an indulgence, Greg, for reading the Bible 30 minutes a day. There's a lot of ways that you can get indulgences. Praying for the poor souls in purgatory. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's um, the uh, we did have a bishop of the Jefferson City Diocese that uh, at one of our conferences that gave a plenary indulgence for everyone that were, was in, connected to the Marian Conference at all. You know, those praying for those uh-huh. attending those. Uh, uh, putting together the team, putting together the conference itself, you know, and uh, so uh, you know it's it's uh, it's like the bishop understanding what the Marian Conference could do for others. It's almost like he did an infomercial for the Marian conferences. You know, everybody needs to go <laughs> to these. He said, and uh, wow. And one thing about the, the plenary indulgence is, you know, your sins have already been forgiven if you. Uh, you know when those that happens, you know, but there's a temporal punishment due to the sins we have, unless we uh, clear the slate, and it's not uh, for the rest of our lives. It's just up to that point in our life where the plenary indulgence will, uh, you know, take care of any temporal punishment that's due uh, up to that point in time. So uh, we, we're very fortunate to have that uh, gift in the Catholic Church. And it always comes with a rubric, like you said, uh, Donald. And that rubric is to uh, 
go to confession and receive the Eucharist and uh, pray for the Pope's intentions and and uh, uh, seems like there's one other thing I just can't remember what it is but uh, if you fulfill the the indulgence it's those things that uh, well, you would be purged of those things if you had to go to purgatory if they, if they weren't uh, uh, by the grace of God get forgiven with a an indulgence the temporal punishment is uh, is uh, mitigated you know so uh, anyway uh, what a beautiful beautiful uh, uh, thing uh, but anyway many popes. Uh, uh, have promoted veneration and given those indulgences for this particular uh, Eucharistic miracle tonight. And in the act of recognition of the relic of the Eucharistic miracle of Casca, in 1687, a text was also reported of a very ancient code of the Priory of St. Saint Augustine in which are described numerous pieces of information regarding the miracle. Beyond this information, the episode is also mentioned in the communal statutes of Cassia in 1387, where it was ordered that every year on the Feast of Corpus Christi, it was, it was that beautiful timing also for this one happening this month, uh, that we're doing this one, Donald, because this, this month mm-hmm. is when we have the Feast of Corpus Christi. Uh, the authorities, the councils, and the people of Cassia should meet in the church of St. Augustine and follow the priest who should carry the venerable relic, the most holy body of Christ, in procession through the city. In 1930, on the occasion of the sixth centenary of the event, event, a Eucharistic Congress was celebrated at Cassia for the entire diocese, Diocese of Norcia. A precious an artistic monstrance was con- consecrated, and the entire historical documentation of the miracle was published. Just another one uh, when we uh, when we uh, take the deeper truth uh, team over to uh, uh, Rome one of these days. Uh, we'll have to go through all of those uh, Eucharistic miracles that happened in Italy, uh, Donald. Oh my goodness! Wouldn't no. that be something? I it would, would think that, that Judy and Paul. I know that they would love to go to Rome. <laughs> oh my! Yes, uh, that would be wonderful. If we're able to do that, Greg. I was in yes. Rome for an hour, literally an hour. But that's that. That's that's pretty amazing. That's a pretty amazing, uh, uh, you know, so many times we do uh, miracles where the priest had, in this case, he had apathy. He, uh, I don't know if he, he he was just nonchalant, I guess you'd say it that way. And uh, he just threw the Blessed Sacrament inside a book and went on to take care of this call. uh, And... uh, when he got there and he got prepared to give the man communion, uh, what, what he had was two blood uh, on on either side of the page, uh, inside the book. Uh, Judy, do you know what kind of blood type that was? That was AB positive. AB positive. <clears throat> and I, I just, uh, I knew you knew that, Judy. <laughs> I knew you knew that, but I just wanted to get you up and in there. But you uh, know, a, a thought great. occurred to me about what this, what that priest did. Uh, you, you've heard of people doing things without really thinking. I think this was a, a quite, a, quite an exceptional example of that. I think that priest just wasn't thinking about what he was doing. I, I agree That's with you. Very, you know, some sometimes you wonder about the uh, level of uh, of uh, supernatural faith that that some have uh, that wouldn't be a, that you would think that on a daily basis, especially if they're handling handling the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our 
Lord that they would have that primary in their mind and how to how to care for it. But you know, sometimes people just drift and and uh, not thinking about it, like you said. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I bet he didn't for, didn't forget it again the rest of his life. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, a, a lot of these miracles <clears throat> happen. I think not just for that individual, which is really shown mercy. Can you imagine that mercy that that priest received as a result of that situation? But because of that situation, the Lord took that and and, and utilized it so that many more people uh, can be affected by that uh, example. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the Lord is able to take a positive out of a negative. And uh, he does that no matter how bad things can be. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's great evil. And the Lord can take a positive out of a negative. And people yeah. don't understand mm-hmm. that always, but it's something that we got to strive for in in our own personal growth. And I like that the uh, the way that you were talking about Eucharistic adoration. I think that's one of the greatest weapons that we have uh, to mm-hmm. confront evil in our time. And that is, if every parish were to come together, uh, you know, within that parish, and have Eucharistic adoration to offer. And people utilize that opportunity. Well, you know the Lord's going to bless it, and uh, so that's what we got to continue to work on towards. And I'm glad that that's an integral part of these Marian conferences. No matter where we go, Amen. where or, or whoever is involved, uh, that is a mainstay. That's the main portion of what we're doing: the Mass, the Rosary, the Divine Mercy. Uh, yes, and yes, it's fun to give these talks. Oh, I enjoy it, and I know you do too, Greg. I, I know we all do, but but uh, you know, you look at what it's for and who it's for, and and hopefully, people will uh, take something away from it, uh, from the talks and and the mass, getting the experiences, and also the. The, the things that we have out on those tables, all those objects and books mm-hmm. and everything, I think those often, uh, often uh, uh, people can hold on to those things. And so hopefully within two or three weeks after the conference, people can go back into the humdrum. But hopefully it's like a, you know, just a, a vaccination, <laughs> a good shot in the mm-hmm. arm, you know. That way uh, uh, people can... Uh, uh, always be able to fall back to these things and, and, and then make the Mass more central in their life. That's the whole goal right there, Greg, is that people's uh, faith grow and and it just continues to, to grow. You don't want to stagnate, and I think these are, these are important. These conferences are important to uh, encourage people. I think we, we've got to... Uh... Yeah, uh, it's got to go away, I mean, like for the rest of their life. You know, that's why our conference is uh, set up to not only uh, for what the speakers do at that moment in time, but also uh, uh, that we send resources home to them and that they uh, that they are blessed to receive the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, set some fires out there. The good Lord says he wishes it was already... A, a blaze, and uh, he's looking for us to use our gifts to do that. It's very important, and uh, because there's souls, souls that are depending on us for sure. Souls are depending on us doing what the using the gifts the good Lord has given us, and uh, each person that has been given gifts. So, all I can tell you guys, if you're listening, don't bury it. Read the story if you want to about what happened when the person <laughs> buried the talents the good Lord gave him. And uh, that's because other people's souls are impacted. If we use our gifts and uh, our silence impacts them in a negative way, if we don't use our gifts. So uh, I had a friend one time that said, silence is not golden, it's uh, yellow. 
So, uh, you know, I thought I thought he when he made that statement, it seems to be uh, so true many times that, uh, you know, people, for one reason or another, that they can rationalize uh, why they don't say something to someone. That it could be the reason, reason that they're here tomorrow or the reason that they go into heaven for eternity. So we're called to that. That's our mission, to... Uh, uh, Love and honor and serve the good Lord till we die, and and do it by bringing souls to Him. So, nothing more important. Nothing more important. And uh, you know, I believe that with my whole heart. You know that we've got to. Uh, you know, the spirit has to come first, and uh, then the life of people. You know, right there with it, and. Uh, Everything that we can do for uh, for souls for eternity, for sure. But anyway, uh, Judy, you want to start out with uh, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, there. Okay. <clears throat> Saint Ignatius became the third bishop of Antioch, succeeding Saint Evodius, who was the immediate successor of Saint Peter. He heard St. John preach when he was a boy and knew St. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. Seven of his letters written to various Christian communities have been preserved. Eventually, he received the martyr's crown as he was thrown to wild beasts in the arena. Consider how contrary to the mind of God are the heterodox in regard to the grace of God which has come to us. They have no regard for charity, none for the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, none for the man in prison, the hungry or thirsty. They abstain from the Eucharist in prayer because they do not admit that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, the flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his graciousness raised from the dead. And that is from the letter to the Smyrnians. Come together in common, one and all, without exception in charity, in one faith and in one Jesus Christ, who is of the race of David according to the flesh, the Son of Man and the Son of God, so that with undivided mind you may obey the bishop and the priests and break one bread, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote against death, enabling us to live forever in Jesus Christ. And that is from the letter to the Ephesians. That's that's a uh, that's something uh, everyone needs to pay attention to. You know, so much of all of them are, but uh, uh, it's the medicine of immortality and the antidote against death, enabling us to live forever ever in Jesus Christ. What does it say, uh, Donald? You know where it is in Scripture where unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. That's right. That's uh, 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 11, 27. Well, that's that's pretty powerful. It comes from from, uh, the good Lord and uh, we we better have a handle on that and we better because of that, we can't just say, I got it, you don't, good luck. You know, we've got to do all we can to evangelize others to come into the uh, fullness of the bride of Christ. The, the uh, We just celebrated the uh, Feast of Pentecost yesterday, uh, which uh, uh, was, a, was when the Holy Spirit uh, came upon them all. And... Uh, in, increase, increase their faith exponentially, really. They were able to walk out there into uh, situations and, and uh, bear witness. And all of, them, all of them had a violent death except for John, didn't they, Donald? Yes, they did. And John, uh, he suffered much uh, for, the, for the Lord, but... Uh, he did not die the martyr's death. But I tell you, what a wonderful opportunity it is for us to be able to 
to walk the road, you know, to to the travel the our faith is is something that we can it's a journey and uh we don't always know what's before us, but we can always yep. trust in him to be with us. And that's that's uh what our 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 goal is to be faithful and try to do what he wants us to do in this journey. And that's important for your families. It's important for your friends, uh, whether you're at work, whether you're home, where whatever you're doing. You know, it's always good to 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 try to live a life that's worthy of our Lord. And none of us, in fact, I love that in that prayer. That just kind of goes to that prayer. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Amen. You know, and uh, speaking about some of the gifts that we all have, Judy, do you have any gifts for us tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, I have um, the newest uh, poem that I received several hours ago. And I think it's it's very fitting for uh, this time of, of year. And it is a very uh, personal, autobiographical poem. Really? I w- yes, yes. <laughs> I was not always as you see, but one day the Spirit passed over me. He touched my heart, my soul my mind, and gave me words of a precious kind. He took a person steeped in sin, one who then could never win. And as he passed over my head, he took away all fear and dread. Christ gives me words to write and share, words that show his gracious care. Blessed words sent here below that we may learn, that we may know the depth of love he feels for us, dying on a cross and thus resurrecting from the grave. He came for all our souls to save. No, I was not always as you see, but God's Holy Spirit set me free. And I ask, please tell us true, did he not do the same for you? Oh, beautiful. That's a, <laughs> and yes, he did. The good <laughs> answer is that yes, he did. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's <laughs> powerful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what the Lord does at these conferences, you know, how many, uh, I mean, you know, Greg, how many times have you been, have you seen good fruit that was born, that was given as a result of these uh, conferences? I think there are many. I think a book could be written about how many uh, people have been affected in a in a very positive way, some you know supernatural way that the the Lord has given us in what what we're doing, and so anything that the Lord touches. That it makes it supernatural just because he touches it. <laughs> Maybe natural in the natural plane, but it's for us. Wonderful. Amen. Beautiful. And so uh, I always look forward to hearing uh, something where somebody uh, uh, was received back into the church or somebody was struggling and... Uh, they're encouraged, and that's what we real. That's what what it really is. A, what all this is about. Our whole thing is about uh, standing up and helping those who are crippled. We're all crippled to some degree. We all are struggling uh, to some degree, and so when we come together, we encourage one another. That's that's really what it, it it's about, and. And hopefully, uh, because of the the Lord's presence among us, that's that's a major thing. 
That's why the Mass is so important, because the Lord is upon us. i got a scripture I'll share. It's coming from uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And uh, it's pretty neat, actually, because it tells you the importance of what we're talking about with tabernacle and whatnot. It says, this is uh, beginning with verse 9, it says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good to have our hearts strengthened. What are you talking about? That's what we've been talking about. It is good to have our hearts strengthened by grace and not by foods which do not benefit those who live by them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The bodies of the animals whose blood and high, the blood the high priest brings into the sanctuary as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate to consecrate the people by his own blood. And that's what we receive at Mass. Oh, ain't that something there, Judy? Ain't that something there, Greg? There is nothing greater. There is absolutely nothing greater. And I'd like to touch on something um, that you all said earlier. Um, I think um, when people stay silent, a lot of times they think that it's not their business what one another person does. But as Catholics, it's always our business. If if we know of someone who's living in very serious sin, we have an obligation to try and turn that person away from sin. Would one of you like to chime in on that? <laughs> Well, obviously. And by the way, uh, Greg had, had to, uh, you know, like Elvis left the building. Well, Greg had to leave the building. He had, I thought so. Uh, he had uh, something that came up, which he it was the, already in the plan. And so that's why we went ahead and did the, the, where he went ahead and did the miracle to begin with at the beginning like like we did because he knew that he was going to be taken off. And so what a wonderful opportunity that is. And uh, I agree with what you're saying there, uh, Judy. In fact, the scriptures tell us, you go to Ezekiel, uh, it tells you that, uh, you know, if a, if a person has gone into sin and you do not warn such a person that not only will the Lord judge you, but he would hold, he would hold us responsible for not warning that individual. Now, if we warn that individual, it's all on him. But if uh, we, uh, but uh, yes, am I my brother's keeper? That goes all the way back to Cain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And so that is a very important aspect of it. And so, oh, man. And, you know, sadly, one, there's always one of things, the things that, uh, sadly, one of the things that people really stay silent about thinking it's none of their business is uh, abortion. Oh, yeah. I mean, how often do yeah. we hear, well, I personally, you know, don't believe in abortion or I wouldn't get an abortion, but if somebody else wants to get an abortion, that's their business, not mine, you know. And it, that is, that's just wrong. That's all there is to it. It's just plain wrong. Thank you about this particular fact that a vast a number of Christians are getting these abortions. Christians are doing this. I mean, people who claim to follow the Lord are doing this. And uh, many of them unrepentant. One mortal sin can cast a person into everlasting hellfire. It ain't going to matter that you were baptized in 1973 or or whatever, you know, if you think you're saved, well, if you live in sin and you die in sin, that's as eternal as you are. And how horrible uh, an end that would be. Well, Donald, isn't it you that has often said one of the things that uh, the Lord hates is the spilling of innocent blood? And I don't think you can get any more innocent than an unborn or newborn baby. 
Oh, uh, exactly. And you're talking about Proverbs chapter six, verses sixteen and seventeen. Uh, it, it is very serious, very serious. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. we are called to do that, to uh, to right those wrongs. That's what uh, liberty is. In fact, I'll uh, I'll share another scripture here because. Uh, you know, by the way, the scripture is a Catholic work. The Bible is a Catholic book. That's so, right. So, you know, people, yes. you know, yeah. they don't always, they think that it belongs to others, but it doesn't. It belongs to the Catholic no. Church. That's who, where it comes from. I think it was monks so, that uh, put it all together. Catholic monks. Well, Pope Damasus called for it at the Council of Hippo in 393. And it was, you know, bishops and, you know, they they slaved over it. But it was yeah. definitely monks who uh, spent a lifetime handwriting yeah. them from one language right, to another. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so well, there were few people handed. back then that had the education uh, to to do something like that. And the monks were among those few. Yeah, sure was. Here's James chapter 1, beginning with verse 22. It says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his own face in a mirror. He sees himself then goes off and promptly forgets what he looks like. But the one who peers into the perfect law the perfect law of freedom, and perseveres, and is not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. Such a Mm -hmm. one shall be blessed in what he does. Think about that one for a minute. Yeah. uh, Well, isn't that what we call living the faith? (laughs) Yes. You know, put put your money where your mouth is, right? You know, uh, practice what you (laughs) preach. We have all of these... (laughs) These, you know, little aphorisms for, for for the same thing that is actually from Scripture, that we are supposed to do what we say we believe in. We are supposed to practice what we preach. <laughs> oh, and, and, and you, imagine, the, imagine the parent telling a child that it's wrong to lie, and then the kid hears the parent lying. <laughs> Talk about mixed messages. <laughs> And that that's that's the whole thing. I mean, that's a simplistic example, but that is that is the basic truth. If you truly believe in Jesus, if you truly believe that he is the son of God and our savior, and you truly believe that, then you have to follow everything that he has taught us. You have to follow the 10 commandments. You have to live according to your belief. I'm sorry. I I get carried away sometimes. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, but you're right. You're right about that. (laughs) And it is so important for us to be able to, uh, uh, you know, live out those beliefs and do so with integrity. At least none of us are perfect, but uh, we strive to be. And we strive to do it with his, His grace. Yeah. And uh, well, wasn't people like Mother to talk Teresa about who said God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's <laughs> why it is important for us to be faithful. And, uh, you know, that, if you're faithful, the Lord can take those things and do something with it. That's the opportunity that he's looking for because... If if it's uh, an open door or an open opportunity, then he can do that. He can knock that out of the park. Even though we are unworthy of him using us, he does it because he chooses to. He does it because he loves us. And when we're uh, available and we're open to do his will, then God can do great things. Uh, you know, this whole thing about homosexuality. Uh there are those who are just blind to that and accepting of that as if it's okay. 
but it's not. And uh, sometimes we turn a blind eye uh, to things. One night after uh, Midnight Mass, I was at Midnight Mass at uh, Fort, uh, uh, Fort, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And after Mass, I was up there talking with some friends. Have you ever had that feeling, uh, Judy, where someone is, you know, you know, just staring at you from staring at you from the back? <laughs> you know, have you ever had that feeling where someone's watching me, kind of thing? Yeah, well, a couple times. Yeah. I had that experience there. These two guys were in the back of the church, uh, just sitting there watching. And I don't know how they pegged me out of a crowd, but uh, they, as I was getting ready to leave the church, one of them stood up, walked over to me, and asked me if I would sit down and talk with them. Well, I, I, I did. And we were talking about, they were asking questions about the church. For about an hour, we were in the church until the uh, chaplain's assistants asked us to uh, they were ready to go home so we took it out into the parking lot we talked out there and we kept on talking until about 6 in the morning and oh. at that yeah at that time I said hey guys my kids are going to want to get up and open presents and stuff so I feel like uh, hey it's time to go I got a rock and roll you know and uh uh well, they pressed upon me, can we get together afterwards, you know, later on in the day? And I thought, I mean, I took down their number and, and whatnot, so if the opportunity availed, I would do so. And, of course, once the kids opened all their presents and everybody was all to the four winds, well, okay, I, I, I gave them about four hours on Christmas Day. And then we went and met the next day and the next day. By the time it was over about a week, I gave about 25 hours of discussion where we talked about church teaching, about values and morals. And I, you know, I didn't know these guys from, from Adam, but I was just basically, they wanted to enter into dialogue about uh, the church. And so you can imagine, uh, well, it, yeah, it pulled me in. <laughs> but when uh, the last day, I met them at the bus stop where they were heading back to Atlanta. I did find out that they were from Atlanta. And we did, uh, I went up there and we kind of sent them on their way. Well, what I didn't know was the whole 25 hours that I spoke with them, at no time did I think about it or challenge them in any way. But these guys were homosexual. I didn't know that. I didn't judge them as that. We did talk about homosexuality, but I said it and, and we spoke about it from the biblical perspective in the same vein that we did fornication and adultery and, you know, all sexual sin. I just, mm -hmm. you know, the, all, all mortal sin. Well, as I found out later from that time that I spent with them, they decided to transform their life from that and they went oh. to, and became Catholic. And oh. one of them, yeah, one of them, was um, diagnosed uh, three different occasions, three different uh, tests. He was positive HIV. Yeah. And in his in his mind and heart, he had basically accepted uh, the responsibility of his actions. But you got to give him respect for that. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, I screwed up, and uh, I, I, this is it. Well. Yeah. And this was, you know, in the 1990s, so that was definitely a bad deal. Today they got medications and drugs that can prolong your life. Still a death sentence, but they can prolong your life. You can treat the symptoms, but you can't treat the, you cannot cure right. the virus. There's no cure. Yeah. But, but, in his case, he uh, went to a Catholic charismatic uh, prayer group uh, meeting in Atlanta. He just happened to go to it. And he's there by himself. He just decided to, to go there. And while he's sitting there, some people came up to him and said, we just got the, uh, the, the feeling that, you know, about praying for, we would like to pray for you. Would that be okay? Well, after that 25 hours that I had given him and all that talk that we did, 
he was and uh, how they've committed themselves now he was open to have someone pray for him and pray over him like that and they did and when they began praying he said he felt this warmth go through his body in such a way that the only other person i've ever heard that where this happened was my mother when she uh, received this kind of uh anointing i guess yeah. you'd call it yeah. and as a result of this though when this guy was doing he was doing these tests for aids and i know what that is uh from having soldiers that had to, to go through this, they had to do their continual testing and whatnot. Well, once uh, he got back into that, uh, they found that he had no longer any AIDS. <laughs> he was totally delivered of AIDS. Oh, oh my! And that's a rarity. That's not that a normal is a happening. That's a true miracle. That's a true miracle. Ex- exactly. And and my point about this is kind of going with what we were talking about, Judy, in that if I would have closed the door on, you know, shut the door in their face when uh, they came to me and asked me, uh, even though it was uh, 1 o'clock in the morning, getting ready to go home from Mass, if I had just shut the door in their face and, and, and not, then I would have blown that opportunity that the Lord presented to me. Right. And that opportunity would have been wasted and no telling what their story would have ended up. Right. And so uh, that just kind of goes. And it tells you also that a person can, I believe that the Lord can uh, uh, save a person from the condition that they're in. And a person can be living in any sin. Homosexuality (laughs) is a serious sin. And... uh, We cannot just sit back and say, well, okay, you're okay and I'm okay kind of thing. No, yeah, and it no. goes with what you were saying, Yeah, perfectly with what well, you were I, saying. I think I think that there are people who, who believe that um, if you don't accept somebody, you know, completely accept them from, for who they are, uh, in, 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 in with the implication that however they live their lives, it's it's perfectly okay. They're okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Like you were saying, they think that if you try to talk to people and and point out the error of their ways, they think you're being cruel, or unkind, or unchristian. And the fact is, it is those who go along letting these people think that their sinful lifestyles are okay, they're the ones who are being unchristian. Because they are not fulfilling their obligation to try and set these people uh, back on the road to salvation. All Christians are supposed to be doing that, not just Catholics, but all Christians who who say that they truly believe in Jesus, when Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, that's what he meant, because he came here to save souls. That That is his yeah. love, and that is what we are supposed to do as as followers of him. We are supposed to try and save souls. That's That's the whole point of these programs is to try and save souls. Whoever yeah. whoever we reach. That's that's the whole point. When when you talk with somebody, you know, if the, especially if they confide in you and say, you know, I'm living like this, and you try to to help them see that they are endangering their immortal souls. That is showing the greatest Christian love that you can show. And what you did for those two men, that's exactly what you were doing, Donald. You were showing true Christian love. You gave of your time. That's one of the things the church asks of us, right? A time, talent, and treasure. You were giving of your yeah. time. And you were also giving of your treasure because part of your treasure there is is your knowledge, your deep knowledge of the the truth of of the faith. Well, that's, you know, that's 
my mom told me when I was growing up that I would have made a good lawyer because <laughs> if I got a, onto a case, I just, I don't know, it just uh, sticks with me. And when I got into, when I came back to my Catholic faith, I guess that just, you know, came right over. I, I just see it as a gift. And uh, thank God. Oh, man. <laughs> as we're talking, I got to just received a cramp and boy do I have to stand up on it have you ever had one of those <laughs> oh sure <laughs> man but I tell you yeah it, it, it's it's offering our time in fact I consider that part of tithing you know yeah we give our treasure what we can but uh, that's part of tithing I think when you give and donate time some people may not have money to give but if you go out there and you mow the lawn, you you take care of, beautify the church, there's a lot of things that you can do that uh, I think the Lord accepts. And, and uh, oh, the sure. time is important. Yeah. And so, yeah, that we invest, you know, our, what is our motivation? That's what it really gets and boils down to. What is our motivation? So... Oh, it should yeah, be love. That, that, it's Christian love. That should be our motivation. That is our motivation. No. And so, well, Judy, you know, you know, we was we, you know, John got sick last night, so we weren't able to come on, and yeah. then I was I was on the net. So, I do appreciate you for coming on tonight. I tell you, I was hoping that you were able to lock in and see what we were. <laughs> Because I, you know, you never know, you never know, and we're trying to do this uh, on Monday nights now, so it become where you know Greg is right. more uh, stable, yeah. and I understand that because when you have uh, crazy things going on, and uh, uh, you go from Wednesday night to Thursday night to Friday night back to Wednesday night, or you know, you, it gets kind of yeah. you don't know what's going on, and I, I, I'm with that. I understand that, so. Uh, oh, man, I, this cramp is not, it is a thing. I ain't leaving. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I worked twenty. I worked all night, uh, and then when I got off work, I drove down to uh, Joplin, which was about two hundred and fifty miles away, and did the. Uh, Spent the day doing uh, and preparing for uh, the conference and participating in the conference. And then after that, I drove back and went back straight to work and worked all night again. And, oh. uh, I mean, they w I was wanting to get back down there, but there was just no way. I was just zonked. There was just no way, in fact. Uh, I, I'm still. Oh, you're that's probably out. one. <laughs> yeah. You're out, kid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, it, it, that was the deal. So uh, I, I'm still kind of. I guess you would call it jet lag. That's what we would call it in the military. I was kind of still kind of going through jet lag because I worked all. In fact, not only did I work last night, I worked all. I did an 18-hour day <laughs> on top of all of this. So, uh, that's, so to get a cramp is kind of almost like a badge of honor now. <laughs> well, like oh, we always goodness. say, we offer it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That is true. And so I'm so thankful. No, so I'm, I'm thankful for what we were able to do, and I'm thankful for tonight. You know, when we yeah. started off, we started yeah. off at uh, 8 o'clock our normal time. And some kind of, I don't know what glitch that hit us, but all of a sudden I got kicked off. And yeah, it, I, I didn't get no warning or nothing. It just went. I know. I mean, I was, I was uh, preparing to get here. it. I was listening, and then uh, it, it just chimed in. Uh, thank you for using Block Talk Radio. Goodbye. <laughs> And I said, yeah. what happened? <laughs> What's going on? I know. I I felt, yeah, it was really bizarre. So I figured, hey, well, you know, I wasn't going to let that stand. So uh, 
Uh, I went ahead and uh, reset it up for another, started a half hour later. And what's so bad about it is how I promoted the show on Facebook. I had, oh, so many people where I had promoted it. And uh, that particular show, they won't be able to see it because it doesn't go to the show. Because it was, in order to... In order to do another show, see, I, I don't have the ability to do two shows a, a day or something like that. <clears throat> I can only do one show. So if I I had to cancel out that particular uh, attempt so we could restart it again, and that's what we did. Yeah. So, well, but people will hear this archive, and I will promote it back. Yeah. Oh, sure. I'll probably sure. wait till. Yeah, I'll probably wait till another day because after throwing it out there and then nobody got a chance to really hear it except for just a few. Because I, I did try to send it to some individuals, like I did you. And uh, you can hear it or check it out. But uh, that's what we do. That is exactly what our, our, you know, whether we're doing it on this radio show or we're doing it at a church it's an opportunity, and I like what you were saying. It is an opportunity, and you never know where someone stumbles in on these shows. We got over fifteen hundred shows now, <laughs> and they're all archived. And somebody just happens to walk on a a topic where it's out there, in uh, uh, I guess you'd say internet land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody just stumbles in on it, and uh, who knows? That's 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 what the Lord He's able to use it. Even we did it three or four years ago. Even that is pretty cool. <laughs> so, but uh, Judy, I am yeah. After last night, uh, uh, it was just kind of well. I mean, you, how often do you have where uh, uh, John calls in sick? Yeah, and that was a uh, very very rare. But uh, you know, this weekend had an effect on him too. So, and that's uh, that does that does. There, there's times when you just gotta rest, you know, because we put a lot on on ourselves too. So it is in t- it is important for us to to chill and and to rest. So, I encourage you to to do that too, there, Judy. I know you've had, you've had, you've had uh, in the past year you've had times when you were. Not feeling well and and oh, whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I have a chronic uh, condition, and it uh, it kind of weakens me and uh, gets the better of me sometimes physically. But I've I've suffered with it for many years now, and uh, the Lord is always with me because I always seem to bounce back. And <laughs> and that's a good thing. And that's what it's yeah. all about. We. Yeah. We yeah. we bounce back, we you know yeah. we we don't stay down. But then, you know once you get a little rest, you 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 bounce back. Yep. So, but Judy, I want to say thank you, and uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, and thank uh, Dr. Gregory Thompson and all those who uh, will be listening to this show or are already listening to it. But I do apologize about the the mishap that we had, but that was that was something that was above us. I don't know why it did that. I really don't. But anyway, here we are. So God bless you, Judy. And uh, hey, Judy, would you go ahead and do a Hail Mary for us? Oh, sure. Go ahead and do a Hail Mary for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And in honor of Our Lady, I'm going to play a song that uh, I know John Carpenter loves as well as I. Good night there, Judy. Good night, Donald. Good night, everyone. God bless you.